I'm a lucky guy. I get to work with the world's greatest athletes and get a front row seat to iconic, indelible moments. Athlete atop the podium, happy tears streaming down their cheeks as their national anthem plays. I bet some of you have wondered. I have skills, hidden talents. I wonder if I have what it takes to be an Olympian. Let me give you the answer. No. No, you don't. Because the odds of becoming an Olympian are 1 in 600,000. This is what an Olympian looks like. Think about a time where you were at the gym, thought you were crushing it, <laughs> and then look at Jessica Zelenka. That's an Olympian. But you know what? If you want to have that Olympic moment, there is an opportunity. There is a sport where you can compete like an Olympian. It's called bobsleigh. Let me take you back to 2013. We were just wrapping up a campaign shoot before the Sochi Winter Olympic Games. When the organizer tapped me on the shoulder, he said, hey, marketing guy, you want to take a ride down the bobsleigh track? Look at me. Do I look like an Olympian? Look at me. My vitals, I'm five foot nine in hockey skates. <laughs> My weight, indeterminate <laughs> and fluctuating. So on the one hand, I had this fear of going down this icy, sloping track. And then on the other hand, I had a, another fear. What would I look like in this suit? <laughs> At the top of the track, I had to make a choice. I could give in to fear, pass up a great opportunity, compete like an Olympian, or I could be vulnerable. I could trust the bobsleigh pilot. While I was debating these in my mind, the guy was like, you gotta go, you gotta make a decision. So I stalled. I said, uh, you know what, I don't know if I have the time. I've got a flight to catch. It's in four hours. Sometimes they leave early. I just don't know if I can do it. That's when the camera guy leaned in and said, dude, the entire ride only takes 60 seconds. Even if you do crash, that's only going to add another five seconds. You got the time, man. So I decided to do it. I got in the sled. The odd thing about bobsleigh is it starts really slowly. So it gives you this false sense of security like, hey, this isn't so bad. I've done tobogganing. <laughs> then the bottom fell out. My insides came up. We started hurtling down the track at speeds of 100 kilometers an hour. As a communicator and marketer, headlines flashed before my eyes. <laughs> Chief marketing officer dies on maiden bobsleigh run. <laughs> Wife says, what an idiot. <laughs> at various points during the ride, we were pulling four Gs. That's like a giant invisible hand pushing you down in your seat while your head rattles around. Before I could blink or throw up, it was over. 60 seconds. The feeling that I had in that moment was indescribable. Adrenaline coursed through my body. I felt like a superhero. It was probably at that point the best day of my life. Except for the birth of my kids. That was very positive, honey. That was great. But you know what? When I was at the top of that run, I didn't want to take the run. I love this quote. It's never the change we want that changes everything. Didn't want to do it. 
And nobody knows change in altering the plan more than our athletes. Let's talk about one of them right now. Rosie McLennan, our London 2012 trampolinist. She is the best in the world at what she does. While she was getting ready for Rio, she went up in the air in a training session. She over-rotated. She fell hard. She had a concussion. She had to trust her medical team. She had to be vulnerable. They told her she couldn't train. Training consisted of being in a dark room for seven months for significant periods of time. Could you do it? Rosie would say that that moment prepared her to win. Going through adversity, being vulnerable, trusting her team, altering the plan, allowed her to be mentally tougher. She would go on to win gold in Rio. She is the first repeat champion in her sport ever. She is a hero in the minds of many Canadians. Adversity and vulnerability made her better. Remember that bobsleigh ride I told you about? And how I had those feelings of exhilaration and feeling fully alive? That was really, really important to me. Because just a few years earlier, I had experienced quite the opposite. Death. This is my family. What we didn't know back then is that cancer would affect all of our lives. We all know that there's a cycle to life. We know that we will eventually lose our grandparents and eventually our parents. But the real test of adversity is what happens when that cycle is upended. What happens when a parent loses a child or you lose someone far too early? Our cycle got upended because of cancer. We know the stats. Two out of five Canadians will be diagnosed. In my family, the stat and the face to it all is four out of five. Cancer will kill one in four. In my family, it was two out of four. Two out of four. My mom's a survivor after three bouts with breast cancer. It would claim the lives of my two sisters. And I just learned last September that I too would be diagnosed with cancer. These are my two sisters, Kelty and Corinne. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how courageously they lived and how bravely they died. It's never the change we want that changes everything. Think about that. For me and my sister Corinne, the change happened with a phone call. She was calling from London. She said, hey, Dare, I've got some news. I'm having an operation tomorrow. They're cutting out my kidney. There's a tumor on it. Don't worry. It'll all be fine. She had a Wilms tumor. It affects one in 10 million. She was the one. It wouldn't be fine. My favorite memory of Corinne was just before she died. We were in her London flat. The red hot chili peppers was blaring in the background. Wine was flowing. The food was incredible. And we were laughing. The problem was, because she had two cancers, laughing hurt. Imagine that. Laughing hurt. Cancer can be cruel. She would end up excusing herself, going to another room, taking a painkiller and coming back. We would repeat that cycle several times. Painkiller. Laughter. Repeat. Corinne would live longer than anyone predicted because of her incredible sense of humor. And studies have shown that people have better health outcomes if they use humor as a coping mechanism. 
This is my sister, Kelty. She was diagnosed with breast cancer two years after we buried Corinne. I remember sitting in the parking lot after an oncology appointment, and she said, I'm going to fight this dare. And I said, Kelty, and I looked into her green eyes, and I said, is there anything I can do? Name it, anything. And she said, there is one thing you can do. Can you please, please change places with me? She got me. That's vulnerability. Vulnerability in the face of death. She was a remarkable woman. Look at her. She's getting chemo and she's smiling. That's vulnerability and adversity. She would help cancer patients. She would run races and raise money. She was incredible. Last September, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I realized, although my sisters were not around to advise me, I could walk in their footsteps. That even though I could not call them anymore, they would be on my shoulders. And they were. I was determined to be open, to be vulnerable. I ended up sharing the news with friends, family, and colleagues. I even did comparisons to this man. You can see the resemblance. A song and dance man, also a skin cancer survivor. Of all the messages I received, and it was amazing, I opened myself up. With my sister's death, I didn't. I got hundreds of emails, posts of support. But the very best was this one, the day of my surgery. DK rocks. That's Derek Kent, by the way. I know you're university students. <laughs> that was the day of my surgery. I left at 5.30 with my wife to the hospital. It gave me so much energy. But you know what? Vulnerability and facing adversity with an open heart and an open mind has helped me in my career. I call this Confessions of a Street Fighter. I want to take you back to the 1990s. No smartphone, no internet, no Netflix. I was basically a caveman <laughs> with nothing. My ambitions and confidence was sky high. Unfortunately, so was Canada's unemployment rate. I was rejected by some of the best companies in Canada, a virtual Fortune 100 of thanks, but no thanks. I was living on my friend's beat-up IKEA couch, eating lots of craft dinner. I decided to take fate in my hands and cold call the Liberal Party of Canada. I asked if there was a job available. The person on the other end of the line said, no, not a paying job. We have a job as an unpaid assistant at reception. I said, uh, you don't understand. I've got a university degree. I don't answer phones. They said, that's the job. So I took it. And sometimes when you're starting out your career, you have to take the lousy job to get the great job. And that was proven true in my case. I would end up going to Ottawa and working for the federal government. A great job. But in politics, sometimes you have to make a move before politics makes a move on you. I would go on to land a job, a dream job at Nike, at Nike Canada. And after performing there, I got tapped to work at World Headquarters, Nike WHQ. When I told my then fiance the news, honey, I've got this amazing opportunity. It's my dream job. I know we're newly engaged, but we're going to move across the continent, away from your family and friends. I told her on a trip from Montreal to Toronto. She cried the whole way. That's five hours, people, <laughs> including rest stops. That's the change that she didn't want that changed everything. 
I remember a moment with my boss when I got to World Headquarters, much bigger campus, 6,600 people. I was the Canadian kid. We had a new house. We had a new daughter. My home life made work life a struggle. I was struggling at work. I decided to be vulnerable. I told my boss at a sushi lunch, I think I need help. I don't think I'm performing up to expectations. He confirmed my worst fears. I had to listen and think, not just hear and react. And then I had to act on what I heard. I turned it around. We set up a game plan. Before I knew it, the same guy who was telling me, you got to up your game, was sending me to New York City for the best job, in my view, at the company, U.S. Media Relations Director for Nike, Inc. I got to rub shoulders with superstars who only operate on a first-name basis. Serena, Rafa, Roger. It was heady times. I was working around the clock. I was bringing my A-game. But you know what happened? Sometimes life gets in the way. Kelty got sick. I was an only child. I needed to come home. That's when the Canadian Olympic team called. They said they wanted a storyteller. They wanted somebody who could apply everything that I learned and help Team Canada. It was a risk. I had to be vulnerable. I had to realize I was leaving a great job with stock options and amazing opportunities at a great company, but join the unknown of the, pro of the public sector, the not-for-profit sector. So I joined up. After a six-month interview process, I became CMO of the COC. This is what I've learned. It's never the change we want that changes everything. Think about it. For me, the bobsleigh ride is like a metaphor for life. It goes far too quickly. You have a choice to get in that bobsleigh or not. Sometimes there's unexpected turns that make your stomach churn. Sometimes there's an invisible hand pushing you down. But you know what? At the finish line, exhilaration. I urge all of you, when presented with a choice, get in that sled. Don't pass up an opportunity because you're scared. Be vulnerable. So when you set out in your careers and in your lives, be vulnerable, be resilient, be bold, take risks. Simple words. They have helped guide me in my life, and I hope they guide you in yours. Thank you very much.